Rise and shine, everybody. It is championship time across the pond at Wimbledon. Good morning to everybody in the U.S. Good afternoon to everyone over at the All England Club. We welcome you to the Wimbledon Championship Preview Show powered by Barclays. You see the women's final coming up in a matter of a couple of minutes, about 30 minutes or so. Right early here in Bristol, Connecticut, alongside Chris Budden, who clearly dressed for the occasion in the Where's all whites. I, I, I didn't get the memo. I planned the I memo. It's a long-standing <laughs> tradition. We'll get you some strawberries. All right, good deal. <laughs> uh, we got a great show for you the next 30 minutes. Got a lot of awesome guests as well to talk both the women's final and the men's final. Um, before we get into all of this, though, Chris, I mean, it's been such an amazing couple of weeks. There's always some great storylines to follow. Has there been one or two that have kind of caught your attention? Yeah, I think everyone would say from the American point of view it's Christopher Eubanks yeah. and seeing what he was able to do and uh, his run that he was able to make uh, as someone who covers also a lot of college sports the amount of college players from the U.S. side that made it into the draw back in the day it used to just be you, you skip college you went straight into the pros and now you see the development side of it and what those players are able to do later on in their careers. Yeah Eubanks has certainly been one of the best stories of the entire tournament we'll talk about him a, lot, a little bit more later on we have Luke Jensen and Chris Almeida joining us to talk the men's five Final. Um, speaking of the men's final, it is now set in stone, yeah. and we have our final. I think it's been the final that everyone was kind of hoping yeah. for, right, with Djokovic and Alcaraz. Um, just for context, Djokovic has kind of had a domination a effect over the last half decade because the last time that he's lost at Wimbledon was 2017. Alcaraz was 14 years old at the time. Djokovic only had 12 Grand Slam titles at the time, and Andy Murray was the number one men's player uh, in the world at that time as well. So, KB, <laughs> the question is, what kind of chance does a player like Alcaraz have yeah. to try and dethrone Djokovic today? You talk about what his dominance is, really, at all Grand Slams, and you think about this next generation, they're like, when can the big three get out right. of this? We've already seen Federer retire. Listen, I think Alcaraz definitely has a shot in this thing. When you look at he's already beaten him on clay a year ago. They are one-to-one, head-to-head. -head. The other thing that Alcaraz has is he's been there and he's done this. Last year at the U.S. Open, uh, winning the championship, so he has the confidence that I can go and I can win on the biggest stage. Here's the deal. You are going up against the greatest of all time. Right. The numbers now say it. Uh, and when it's not just the physicality that Djokovic provides, it's the fact that he is one of the best mental players, athletes of almost any sport. So you got to be able to win some free points on your serve. You got to be able to be creative and you got to be able to play the long game. You got to be able to withstand because Djokovic, every single point, the mental aspect, I mean, he was down a set last year against Kyrgios, was able to come back. The guy just never, it never phases him any moment of any point of any game. Yeah, again, that's going to be tomorrow. Uh, we can tune into that uh, as well. More on that later. Over to the women's side, because this is also a tightly contested matchup and another matchup uh, between foes that have already seen each other mm -hmm. earlier this year and on Jabor and you have Marketa Vondrosova as well. What do you make of, of this matchup? Yeah, it's, it's cool that it'll be a first for any of these players, but I think mainly for on Jabor, when I look at what happened to her last year, she was up a set in the Wimbledon final and she admits it was heartbreaking for her to lose that. She carries the weight of her country on her shoulders. A woman from Tunisia, an Arab man or woman, has never won a Grand Slam final. But like that country rallied around her. When she got back home last year, they had this huge celebration, a homecoming for her, and what that would mean for her country to be able to come home and hold up that trophy. Uh, it, she's, you, know, you talk with people all around women's tennis and they fall in love with her. And then Vondrosova, an unranked player, has never won a Grand Slam. And so I think it says a lot about the parity of women's tennis. Uh, you know, and this, it'll be interesting. You got a lefty, she's creative in Vondrosova against Jabor, who has the power. Uh, I just think that for, for Jabor, after last year, she really worked on the mental side of the game. Uh, and to me, if you're if you're going to ask for a prediction here early in the show, right. uh, that, that would be mine. But, I mean, just incredible stories all around. And Vondrosova, the first unseeded woman to reach the Wimbledon ladies final since Billie Jean King did yeah. so uh, in 1963. So a ton of great storylines, both on the men's and the women's side as well. We have a lot to talk about today, and we will get to all of it. Um, I was fortunate enough to sit down with Bianca Andreescu recently. And she actually played both of those women opponents in the last few months. She knows a lot about both of them. Check it out. 
All right, we're getting ready for the women's final here in mere minutes. But first, we bring in somebody who has seen both of these players relatively recently. That's Canadian tennis star and author of BB's Got Game, Bianca Andrescu. Bianca, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thank you for having me. Excited for this. Of course. Uh, before we get into the tennis, because we'll get into all of it. But I am curious. Every time I turn on the TV to see Wimbledon, see the matches over the last couple of weeks, it just looks like the most picturesque place in the world. And I got to imagine it's relatively close to that. Do you remember the first time you stepped on the grounds at Wimbledon and what, what kind of were some of those thoughts going through your mind then? Yeah, I was um, 16 or 17. I remember going through qualies, which is at another site and, um, you know, coming from qualies and then actually being in Wimbledon, I think it was my first ever main draw Grand Slam. So I was absolutely starstruck by everything I was seeing because everybody, you know, thinks of Wimbledon as like the best tournament on tour, the biggest tournament on tour. And that's how it felt when I did, you know, step on there for the first time. Um, I absolutely, I, I don't want to say the word crap my pants during my match. <laughs> so nervous like every shot i would be shanking even though i wasn't even playing on a big court but i mean looking back now um obviously it was a great experience but definitely wimbledon has something special to it it's it's tradition right and and now you've had some success here at wimbledon specifically this year making it to the third round what was it about your game you know leading up to the tournament and also, you know, over the last you know week or so that allowed you to elevate and make a deep run in the tournament. Yeah, I, I don't feel that uh, the matches before that necessarily prepared me for the moment because I didn't feel like I was playing my best tennis. Um, and then, you know, Grand Slams in a way are a little bit different and, you know, playing in front of a bigger crowd, for instance, my match on center court versus my other two matches, they it just they just felt different um mm. unconsciously you know i felt like i had a better attitude um i was just in the zone uh, a little bit more than i was uh on the previous two matches but it was incredible i mean i've never stepped on center court until i did for the match i never you know like even went out for a picture or anything like that and um honestly i thought it would feel more intimidating and i'd be more nervous but i felt really really good there honestly i felt like um in a way like i belong to play on that court and you know it was a point here a point there that really made the difference but taking a lot of positives no question about it. And there were positives, too, in your third round matchup with one of the finalists that's on Shabor. Uh, you took the first set from her, but uh, what was it about her game that, that you kind of thought and found most challenging? Mm -hmm. uh, she's a very tricky player. I mean, she can slice, drop shot. Um, she can hit incredible forehands out of nowhere. And you basically just don't know what you're going to get from her. She can be a little up and down. So when you get your opening, you better take it or else, you know, um, she'll just come back and hit three aces because her serve is also very good. So I'm, I'm definitely not surprised that she's in the finals again. And then on the other side, too, with Marquette Vondrasova, you've also seen her earlier this year. And as a left handed player, it seemed like she gives players fits because it's just so unique. And the spin that she uses, especially on grass, that can make it challenging. Um, what, what is it about her game that's just so unique and challenging to opponents? Yeah, um, yeah, I definitely don't feel bad that I lost to her twice this year after the results <laughs> she's having right now. Um, I mean, she is, like you said, she's lefty. Nobody necessarily likes playing lefties. Um, they're kind of like the odd ones out because you don't normally play them. Um, and she's also a very tricky opponent. She can do it all. She can slice, drop shot. Definitely not surprised as well because um, she may not have like the best results, but anything can happen. And this was her, I guess, dream tournament. So I'm very happy for her. She's also a very nice woman. And then finally too, with the way that Wimbledon's been going, there's storylines abound, right? And Alina Spitalina has been one of the powerful storylines that we've talked about certainly over the last couple of weeks nine months after giving birth not only is she just playing in the tournament but she's taking down the world number one and making the semi-final here at wimbledon uh in your mind in your opinion with everything that she's done and, and all of the other great women's tennis players that have come before 
Wh where do you think the game of women's tennis is now? And when you see a player like Svitolina, where do you think the game of tennis is going on the women's side? Mm -hmm. um, I was definitely rooting for her to win. I mean, like what she's been going through the past, you know, year and a half is just incredible. Coming, coming back from, you know, giving birth is, you know, it's, it's not an easy task to do. And obviously what's going on with Ukraine, it would have been really nice to, you know, show that support in an even greater way. But I mean, she's done amazing regardless. Um, I think she's only been on tour right now for like three, four months, crazy stats. But um, I do think women's tennis is developing in a very beautiful way. I love that uh, women are more open to, you know, standing up for what they believe in, uh, being able to, you know, give birth and then come back. Um, it really shows a very positive example for the next generation as well. But it's also nice to see different winners and not always having the same people do well all the time. I think it brings also um, just a different, a different taste to the game. No question about it. And such a powerful player as well. Um, one of the best parts of Wimbledon too, and when we talked about it before we, we started this interview is to expect the unexpected because I feel like you always see something new every single year there. And this year we saw a chair umpire having to tell uh, some of the fans in attendance not to open champagne Ladies and gentlemen, please, if you are opening a bottle of champagne, don't do it as the players are about to serve. Thank you. Oh, that. don't you love that? The most Wimbledon warning I've ever heard. I've never seen that before. Have you ever seen a chair umpire, like, actually talk to the crowd and, and tell them, hey, you can't do this? I mean, we've heard, like, the let's be quiet, but, like, I've never heard anything like that. Yeah, very specific, but obviously he he recognized what it was. Um, I think personally, since it's Wimbledon, he wanted to really, I guess, in a way, keep the tradition and be very, you know, posh and yeah. uh, very respectful. I mean, you wouldn't be hearing that at the U.S. Open. I mean, you can't even hear what's going on all the way up to the <laughs> to the last rows, but. Um, it is. It is pretty funny. I mean, I, the guy wanted to, you know, just have some have some champagne <laughs> guy alone. I'm sure the I'm sure the players didn't mind, but yeah, I, I saw it's pretty funny. <laughs> I don't blame him. I, like the atmosphere has been just tremendous, and it, it's been great talking to you, Bianca. Thanks so much for taking the time. Of course, I enjoyed it. Well, tomorrow morning, Wimbledon coverage of the men's final starts at 8 a.m. Eastern time, 5 a.m. Pacific on ESPN and the app with the Gentlemen's Championship. Number two seeded Novak Djokovic continues his quest for a historic 24th Grand Slam title against top seeded Carlos Alcaraz. Now joining us to talk a little bit more about the men's final that will be Sunday morning, Chris Almeida, a sports editor and writer who has covered the sport for the last seven years, and Luke Jensen, Grand Slam doubles champion men. Thank you so much for joining us. Luke, I'm going to start with you. Djokovic is here again. It's the same story, and it just continues and continues to run. He hasn't lost in Wimbledon since 2017. Oh, by the way, he's 36 years old, Luke. How does he continue to do this? Well, just like TB12, right? He's mastered the art of nutrition, longevity as an athlete. Back I played when in the 90s, you were really done in your early 30s. These days, the guys know every molecule, every calorie that's going into their body. And then the range of motion. We never stretched in the 90s. You know, Agassi Sampras, we'd grab a burger at McDonald's and go play five sets. <laughs> These guys go out and they stretch for 45 minutes before every exercise they do. And then they step on the court and they can play. And Djokovic mentally knows he's battled Federer. He's battled Nadal. He's battled Murray in those early years. And now he's running against the young pups and he has it mentally over. Luke, you're doing your recovery clearly at the beach. Uh, <laughs> congratulations to you. Chris, I'm going to ask you the same question. I mean, how is it that Djokovic has continued to do this now into his mid and, and what will probably be late 30s? Because yeah. it doesn't look like he's slowing down anytime soon. I mean, he's just got everything, right? It's He's not reliant on only fast twitch muscles, on only reacting at the net. He'll, you know, grind you down from the back of the court. He's he's not as reliant on just seeing something and reacting to it. And that combined with, with his fitness, which obviously we know he prioritizes. We, you know, 
to make sure he only drinks room temperature water, eats the same thing every day. Uh, he's prioritized that for so long. He's just going to be able to outrun everybody. Yeah, Chris, you have an article out in GQ right now, and it's titles, Is It Alcaraz's Time? Now, you did make a point in that article to say this is still Novak Djokovic's world, but w what in your mind gave you the thought that, all right, Alcaraz is ready to take a bite out of that atmosphere for Djokovic? Well, it's kind of the same thing as we were just saying. He's got everything. He's got speed. He's got power. He's been able, you know, he loves that drop shot. He's been able to change pace like no one I've seen in a long time. Uh, and clearly he's, you know, it's a cliche, but he's got it something mentally that a lot of the other challengers haven't really shown in a long time. Obviously, Djokovic wasn't playing at the U.S. Open last year when Alcaraz won his major but as a 19 year old, he went and he took that. He beat everyone else in his generation in route to taking that title. And then obviously stress got to him at the French Open. He admitted that that played a factor in his cramping in his match against Djokovic. But he could have wilted here on grass, a surface that he wasn't as used to until this year. And instead he won the title at Queens Club and he came here and he put everyone away in route to the final. That shows me that he's got something that a lot of these other guys have not had. Luke, you've played on this stage. You've also, you still coach a lot. Uh, when you, if you were going to talk to Carlos Alcaraz about what he needs to do today against Djokovic, what would be your advice? You just said smile. Make sure you enjoy every opportunity. You're playing one of the greats, if not the greatest of all time that's played this game. Go out there. Your time will come. Hopefully this is your moment. At the French Open, you were thinking too much. You were stressing too much. Take that big game of yours and shove it down Djokovic's throat. He's the old guy, right? He's top of gun maverick, man. Though His days are numbered if you go out there and actually annihilate him with all your power. And you remember, you've got the age factor. You've got the power factor. And go for it. Don't let anybody think that you're not the man right now for the job. One of my favorite stories from Wimbledon has been Christopher Eubanks, and I think he's been this favorite story of many here at Stateside, Luke. And you had a feature of characteristics of a top player that you have put out there. Um, what is it about Eubanks that you, you kind of think could be a top player? What characteristics, what makeup does he have? And, and just how high is a ceiling for a unique player like Eubanks? You know, I've been following him a long time. He wasn't a great junior out of the United States, and Georgia Tech took a flyer on him because he's six foot seven, kind of wiry. But what you see is a culmination of a lot of hard work through the years in the minor leagues. I coached him in world team tennis, and what I found was he's a very intelligent player with a 140 mile an hour gun. He's got a hand cannon. So when you can outserve everybody, when you can take forehands and backhands, and with one swing and the point. You're a very dangerous lethal weapon. Now he's starting to mature into understanding how the parts work, how he uses his slot shot selection. When he makes sure he's patient and allows the match to come to him, then he can start firing his weapons, firing his missiles. That's when he's dangerous. To me, because he is so long, he can serve in volley. Because he's come through the minors, he's hungry. He's been such a fantastic story to watch. Okay, I want to look again to tomorrow's gentlemen's final. I find it so interesting the way that the crowd has changed throughout Djokovic's career. Sometimes he's the villain, sometimes he's the favorite. Chris, I'll start with you. Who do you think the fans will be cheering for tomorrow? That is hard to say. So he's not playing Roger Federer anymore, <laughs> and we all knew how that was going to go. Uh I'd have to say it's got to be an even split. I mean, obviously the fans love him there now. Now that he's, <laughs> a, you know, uh, it wasn't always that way, but he's the four-time defending champ. I feel like he's earned it a little bit. At the same time, everyone loves a challenger. Everyone loves an upset. Everyone, uh, for everyone that loves a Borg, somebody loves a McEnroe as yeah. well. And we have, you know, somebody who's, coming up and wanting to make some noise. And I'm sure if that match is close on Sunday, uh, a lot of people will be rooting for some new blood to grab that trophy. Luke, you were there. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's Djokovic. It's, it's, I, do you really go against Tom Brady in the Super Bowl? Do you really go against Novak Djokovic with 23 majors in his pocket? And to me, it's always going to be experience. 
How does Alcaraz get out onto that court? The court in tennis. This is the biggest court. Every major champion who's ever played has played on that court, won on that court. Got to prove yourself on that track. But to me, it's still Djokovic's time. He's going to put a lot of balls in play, and he's going to use his mind as his weapon, and the youngster just isn't ready yet. All right, we've got about 30 seconds left. Chris, I'll start with you. Who's going to win this match? It's, it's Djokovic. He's, he's just rock solid, hasn't given up anything there in a long time. Hard to see it going uh, Alcaraz's way the first time around, maybe next year. Luke, you agree there? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's the biggest court. I'll stay. It's the moment. It's a three out of five sets. If it's two out of three, I can see the youngster hitting shots that are just unbelievable. We're going to see some great trick shots, but it'll be Djokovic holding the trophy for number 24. All right, Luke, Chris, thank you guys for joining us. We appreciate it. Enjoy the match. Thanks, guys. Thank you. (laughs) There's nothing like being at Wimbledon. And for the fans who attended a match, not only did they see great play on the court, but they were also able to attend unique fan experiences thanks to Barclays. The Barclays Fan Zone treated guests to one-of-a-kind experiences unlike anything in sports. You've heard about the famous Wimbledon tradition of strawberries and cream? Well, the Barclays Fan Zone had their own strawberries and cream. And not only did guests get to eat the famous treat, but they got to see where the Fan Zone grows their very own strawberries here on the 80 Acres Vertical Farm. Fans can also stop by the Deuce Bar to get refreshed with energizing juices to give them a boost. Think you could return a serve from Francis Tiafo? Take on the tennis simulator and try your luck you could win a pair of tickets to next year's championships. FanZone's guests also have the opportunity for player Q&As and unique photo opportunities. And returning this year is The Hill in New York, where Barclays brings the unique atmosphere of Wimbledon to the fans in New York. Thank you, Barclays, for continuing to elevate the fan experience. Well, attending Wimbledon is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. That was a look around the grounds powered by Barclays. You are watching the Wimbledon Championship preview show powered by Barclays. As we get you ready for the women's final here, we are mere minutes away. So time now to bring in Alexandra Stevenson, who has played at the highest level over there at Wimbledon. She is there for us now. The women's final is set. Alexandra, we have Jabor and Vondrasova getting ready to square off in a couple of minutes. And we will have a new champion here at Wimbledon. But while we will have a new champion, this is not the first time that these two have met. You have Vondrasova, who, uh, you know, has the couple of victories on clay courts this year. Ons had the victories on the grass. So how much weight do you put on those past performances today? Well, it'll be interesting because uh, Vondrasova beat her at the Australian Open this year in three sets and Indian Wells. So those were the hard court tournaments. And Australia is a fast court, which is similar to grass. The bounce is a little bit higher out there. So I'm looking to a great match. I really feel like Ons has the edge here because she's had her redemption tour. She's beaten Sabalenka and Rybakina. She got her revenge matches, and this will be her third match to get her revenge. She's more calm. She has had the situation before, and she's ready to win it. Alexander, you mentioned it. This is now the second Wimbledon final that we're seeing Ons Jabor in. What about her game translates so well on grass? Well, she has a very low toss, and she's able to hit the low slice serve on the deuce side and on the ad side well. She also can mix up her pace very well. She has a lot of variety. Her backhand down the line is a great shot, and that'll be useful today against Von Drusova because it'll go right into Von Drusova's backhand. She's also able to open up the court and move forward, and she has that tricky drop shot. Marquette Von Drusova has a tattoo on her arm that says, quote, no flowers, no rain, no, no rain, no flowers, excuse me. So uh, <laughs> it's been a long journey for uh, this player. You have the injuries as well coming back. Um, it, it's been amazing to watch her make this run. And regardless of a win here today, it would appear as if the flowers have started to bloom, Alexandra. Yeah, so last year she had a cast on her left wrist. She came to Wimbledon to watch her friend, and then she went to London for some fun. And this year she's made quite a run. Jess Pagula did have chances to take her out, but 
Vondrosova has just been playing so well with her lefty variety. She hasn't been afraid and she's been able to take it. And she has had some ups and downs with injuries, but she has such a big game and the lefty hand, her lefty hand is such a weapon out here on the women's tour and it's really showing up. Wimbledon has historically been a place that favors servers who can utilize the surface to their advantage. Von Drusova has served well in this tournament, but she's been incredibly impressive in the receiving and in the return game. Is that a game plan that she can still utilize here in a couple of minutes? Oh, for sure. Owen Shabur has to bring her first serve percentage up and defend her serve very well because Von Drusova has been leading in return of serve games. And she's just dangerous. She gets the ball back at you and gets into the point. She doesn't give you free errors. And on, on the grass, it's all about your serve and your return. If you remember when Andre Agassi won Wimbledon, he was just getting all those returns in and ripping them. And he was known more for his return than his serve. So a good returner can upset a person that is serving well, especially today, although I've heard the roof is closed. So that should even it out a little bit more because it's very windy out here today. Alexandra, I'm curious when you look at the future of women's tennis. Today we'll have a first, a first-time winner, but we could also have the first African woman to ever win a Grand Slam, maybe the first time an unseated player ever wins a Grand Slam. When you look at what this means for women's tennis, the parity around it, what does it say for the future of women's tennis? I think it's wonderful. Look, if Ann Shabur wins, the whole nation of Africa is going to be so excited and the first woman of Arabic descent. But Vondrosova, first unseated women, women's finalist, maybe a champion. It's just the women's game right now is wide open and it's, it's exciting to see who can break through. Although they are talking about the big three, they really have to add in the Ann Shabur. She's been three out of the five last Grand Slam finals so you can't forget about her and she's had the experience and just the fact that she could win would be a huge deal women of color woman from africa tunisia how she grew up and how she got here and it, it would just be a fairy tale ending to her journey today alexander who gets it done today in your opinion do we have on jabour get some revenge from last year do we have an upset in store today I'm going to go with Anne Jabeur. Look, she's worked really hard. She's much fitter this year. She's using her legs well. She's had her revenge matches. And as a player, you know, when you lose to somebody twice, the third time you want to get them. And she's already done it with the two other players. So she has to continue it on today. So I'm going to pick Anne's. You're there. Do you have a sense of who the crowd will be favoring? Well, the fans love Anjabur. She's a lovely lady. She's inspirational. And look, Marketa Vondrosova is a great story as well. But I'm going to pick that the fans are going to be on Anz's side, especially what happened last year. She had her chances and she just got a bit too defensive and too silly with the drop shot. And the crowd will want her to win today. Last one for you, Alexandra. Um, there's so many storylines and have been in this global tournament. Uh, has there been one that has kind of stood out to you over the course of the last couple of weeks? Oh, well, I mean, come on, guys. Chris Eubanks. I know we're talking about the women here, but I love that Chris Eubanks had a run. I was cheering him on since uh. he, he qualified to the quarters. I qualified to the semis. And I had a big serve and volley baseline, one-hand, backhand game. I had 57 aces when I got to the semis. And Chris Eubanks, his serve, his forehand, his one-hand, backhand, it was like traditional grass court tennis. So for me, that was the story of the tournament. And then you can't forget, the big story of the tournament is Djokovic and Alcaraz, the showdown tomorrow. Who's going to win that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, looking at both players, I would love it if Alcarez could make an upset. But Djokovic is so functional, and his defense to offense is off the charts at this level of his game. I just feel like it's his destiny to get number 24. Yeah, it's going to be an exciting couple of days out there at Wimbledon. You said you'd been there for 13 days. I'm sure you're excited to get back home as well. Alexander Stevenson, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. 
Yeah, I, look, I, I, I'm with her on all of those storylines. Yeah. Uh, it was great to have her join us, but, you know, it, it's been such an exciting tournament, and you never know what you're going to see. Like, and to see what Eubanks did, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's been a long time since we've had a story like his. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you look at the future of American tennis. There were a lot of college players that you saw in Wimbledon. I mean, you look at the future of what we have here. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, and Eubanks was a guy who was – going to maybe hang it up, right, and yeah. not play tennis again. And there maybe he is. Maybe joining making... us here one day, right. sitting on a couch. Right. <laughs> and now, now he's doing so well yeah. out there. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be an exciting last couple of days out there at Wimbledon again. Um, this has been the Wimbledon Championship Preview Show powered by Barclays. For Chris Budden, I'm Sam Ravich. Enjoy the championships, everybody.